Namaste. It's always a delight to share the stage with uh, Dr. Swami. I feel that he is coming down in history as the most important Indian thinker in terms of clarity, originality, courage, impact, and I think that all of us and all of you are very fortunate to be active at this point in time, aligned with him, and there's no better yagna you could do than to continue his work, follow in his footsteps, and take it forward. My research on Indian grand narrative, I want to first explain what the term means. It's a technical term. And not just, okay, Amari Kahani Kya Hai, that's a popular term. But there's a technical meaning also. And then I'll talk about one particular chapter, which, is, uh, which I've never spoken about before publicly. And it's a particularly controversial chapter. So you guys pay attention. <laughs> First, the general perspective. You know, after India's independence, there were five waves, five waves of studying India, five different drishtis, five different types of siddhant on studying India from the West. And I've talked about it, the five waves of Indology. One of them is postmodernism. And postmodernism is particularly dangerous because it comes across like, you know, we're all one Masudeva Kutumbukam, we talk. It, it, I think I'll put this away. Postmodernism is particularly dangerous because it seems to talk like Vasudeva Kutumbukam type of discussion. We are all one, no borders and so on. But actually, it's the most dangerous thing that we could be hosting. And our, our uh, especially our English honors people and social sciences people have brought it in in a big way. So I want to spend a little bit on that because the term Grand narrative is something that they coined. So the West developed, you know, modernity, science, technology. That was the age of modernity. But then they were very shaken up that modernity had climaxed in two exceedingly horrifying things. One was Nazism. They were, one, they were the most modern state. So that's the culmination of modernity in the 20th century. It horrified these intellectuals. And the second was the rise of communism and it killed 100 million people. So people who were Marxists were looking for a different spin. Without giving up Marxism, they were looking for a different spin. And they also wanted to find out how come many countries did not have a communist revolution, although there's a big disparity between rich and poor. They just didn't have a communist revolution. So they kept coming up with different theories. Now in that mantan among the left, within, foreign, within Europe and US, which got exported to India, they came up with this idea that a grand narrative, and this is their term, and that's why I'm giving a response to that term, a grand narrative is inherently abusive, inherently oppressive, because it's the result of elitists. So whether the Nazis came and built a grand narrative, whether the communists came and built a grand narrative, whoever builds a grand narrative is never something that is bottom up, it's never of the people. It is always some male narrative over female, majority over minority. So these are all grand narratives. So what they decided is, that there should be something called history from below, which means the Amagni history, and that they call subaltern studies, which means study this minority's narrative, that minority's narrative, study the narratives, plural, many, many small narratives from below, which are trying to challenge and topple the one grand narrative. And this is where the breaking India comes in, because the whole idea of, the, of this project of toppling the grand narrative is to empower small, small little fragments, separatist groups, 
create their narratives, create a narrative of you know Maoist, create a narrative of this tribe or this jati or this community, this particular religion uh, against the big narrative. Now the interesting thing is, the people who came up with this theory did not intend it for India. They intended to deconstruct the French grand narrative in Africa and give the power back to the French and the British grand narrative in the colonies and give it back to the colonies. So the purpose of Europeans to create this grand narrative thesis that grand narratives are bad and you should replace them, that was different. But Indian leftists took this, brought it in and started deconstructing Hinduism as the grand narrative and started deconstructing India as the grand narrative. So in the 80s and early 90s, it was very fashionable to talk about grand narrative and you see many dissertations and many books and papers when they talk about grand narrative it's some horrible evil thing. It is oppressive, it is top down. So I decided to do exactly the opposite. That is why I picked their terminology and turn it around and give it a whole different meaning. In fact, point by point I find flaws in their whole scholarship. So that is why I use the term grand narrative not some random, not a term with a sort of common meaning, but a very technical meaning. During my business days, the introduction mentioned from Ganesh that I had companies in 20 countries. One of the things I always did was try to understand the grand narrative of any place I did business. Whether it's France, whether it is Korea, whether it is, you know, China, whether it is Mexico, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, or all kind of places. I would always spend a certain amount of time, Indonesia I learned a lot. I would spend a lot of time asking, who are you, how do you see yourself, what is your sense of history, what keeps you together, what are your aspirations, what is your religion, you know, all kind of things that one would study with a sympathy. And I found that corporate leaders in these countries were very proud of their grand narrative. So it convinced me that this whole leftist postmodernist project had failed. It had failed. Because, you know, in France, while they're very leftist and all that, uh, postmodernist, but every Frenchman knows what is pride of his, you know, whatever it is, whether it is their wine, whatever it, they're proud of, fashions, uh, you know, every country has this pride of heritage, something very extraordinary about them. So I started in, as part of my corporate, uh, my, my entrepreneurship, I started understanding the grand narratives and people took me seriously. So I would come back next time to Poland and tell them not what, I, what else I've learned about their grand narratives. They were very impressed. They thought that nobody else, no other Indian had come and taken it this matter seriously. Because a typical Indian businessman goes there, he doesn't want to hear all these kind of things. He just wants to talk about, you know, secular, you know, financial stuff, accounting stuff, market share, all that very no culture involved and I was very interested in understanding culture. So for example, I understood in Indonesia why they have Hindu names. They are all called Ram, Sita, their bank and they are Muslims. Most of them are Muslims but they have their Hindu names. Why is that so? What is the origin of that? And, 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 and in, after numerous conversations I got a lot of insight and this was actually a business tool. You can, you can relate to business people in other countries better if you understand their culture with sympathy and they realize that you are honest about it and you are not just pulling a fast one. So I don't know why our, uh, the Tatas and the Infosys and these kind of people don't inculcate training about other countries' grand narratives as part of their corporate training. In fact, I have some relatives who are very senior in some of these top few Indian companies I don't want to name. And when they visit the US, they are visiting one of their subsidiaries, they are visiting some factory and all that and they are having uh, some argument with the local workers. It is very clear that the Indians coming from headquarters in India just don't understand the grand narrative of these people which is not very conscious. It is unconscious in them, in their, in their psychology it is clear. And so there is this barrier because the Indian is talking to them without really knowing how they are thinking deep inside. And so this is this kind of a uh, lack of appreciation. I was uh, inspired as a child, when I was reading the history of the East India Company, I was very inspired by the investment the East India Company made in understanding Indians. 
And we think we think that they did us a favor. They're translating some Sanskrit books, and Max Miller came. Max Miller didn't come, but he was translating. And these other fellows came. And what all they did, you know, uh, various uh, Sanskrit scholars and anthropologists and social sciences people came. Actually, they were trying to understand how we, who we are, to be able to manipulate, to be able to make us laugh, make us cry, make us fight, and, uh, to rule over us. You need to understand. So this business of uh, understanding the grand narrative of people became very important to me. Being based in the U.S. for the past uh, 47 years, which means I've lived there longer than the vast majority of Americans have, because younger than that, most of them. So having lived there so long and being a very keen person studying the grand narrative issue, I, uh, I, I've written actually two or three big volumes which I have, I have yet to publish on the American grand narrative and how it pertains to their policy towards India and what India should know about it. Now, United States has an official name for their grand narrative. This is very interesting. There's a name for it. It's called American Exceptionalism. If you search American Exceptionalism, you will find that since the late 1800s, this term has been used. Actually, the term started even earlier in the 1600s, before there was a USA. But in the, in the mid late 1800s, it became very popular. And since then, every single president, doesn't matter which party, has talked about American exceptionalism as his ideal. And you can watch Fox News, which is right wing. You can watch MSNBC, which is left wing. Uh, they are all proud of the American exceptionalism idea. All of them. So you want to understand, and this is taught in schools, the founding fathers, you know, what is great. American exceptionalism in a nutshell means that we, the Americans, are the world's exceptional people. We are the world's exceptional people. Now, there's many versions of it. There is the Judeo-Christian version which says this is the Garden of Eden as described in the Bible. There is the secular left-wing version of it which says we have this work ethic, we have this great constitution, uh, we are the land of R&D and science and technology, everybody wants to come here. So wh whatever the particular point of emphasis might be from one interpretation to the other. They all believe in the American exceptionalism. There's a name for it and the bottom line is that we are the world's exceptional people. Now other countries may not have a name but it is clear that China has this. When, when I used to do business, Chinese leaders, this I'm talking about before they became so powerful, I'm talking about early 90s when I used to visit there a lot. Chinese leaders were inculcated from childhood there is something grand and special about our country. Japanese very clear, very clear. So French of course, British, Russians, all these kind of places. So I started systematically looking at the issue of Indian grand narrative. I, I feel that at one time Ramayan was our grand narrative. It was performed in every village. Every Jati was part of it. It was a story of our story. This is our story. A grand narrative is, is that kind of a thing that brings us together. I remember even in my childhood in the 60s, 50s and 60s, in Delhi, we used to do Ram Leela, for, it took a month, you know. Everybody who had some role, we all spent time, you know, making a bow, painting this, painting that, like that. So I used to uh, play Lakshman, that was my role. So, you know, it's like in the neighborhood, they would say, Haan, Lakshman, uh, you are Lakshman like that. So I, that is how you know. So somebody is known in this way, some tough guys, Ravan, like that. So, you know, we are kids, we are having fun. There is no barrier, no boundary, and you go to, you go, and, and, and you go to uh, villages, you will find that uh, Ram Lila was a collective celebration of grand narrative, unfortunately destroyed and turned from a participatory thing, part you participating, to a passive viewing TV. So first it became uh, something that uh, Ram Lila used to be then enacted in a very high class way in Delhi. There was a Ram Lila, I think government did it. So instead of us doing it in our neighborhood, every uh, hundred different neighborhoods doing their own Ram Lila, everybody would just go and watch the Ram Lila. So it became passive. But at least the, the performance was live. And then a few years later it became, became TV. So now that's gone. So the, the idea is no longer that I put it in my body, I enact it, I feel a certain way, I feel a certain way towards my uh, you know, fellow 
actors in this and so on. So this is actually a grand narrative. You live your grand narrative. Grand narrative is something you embody. So when you when you want to interpret whether it is Donald Trump or whether it is his opponent or some previous guy or whether it is some fellow from the US or Russia or wherever who comes to India and you are negotiating, you must know their grand narrative in order to understand who it is, what is he talking about, when he's saying this, what does it mean, what's real, what's not real, how do I tell him something so I make a strong point but I don't hit him hard where it will really hurt him and he may come back at me. So how, how to negotiate? You need to know the other side. I mean this every, every businessman knows. You got to understand the other person's psychology. And to understand their psychology, you have to understand their grand narrative. It's absolutely mind-boggling that Ministry of External Affairs, ICCR, which is the Indian Council of Cultural Relations, don't have a clue about this. Because I've sat and talked to some of their people, the Nehru Center people and various people. Nor do I think that Culture Ministry, nor do I think our uh, uh, HRD or any of those really understand this idea of grand narrative, be it somebody else's or be it our own. So this is a pretty serious state of affairs. So grand narrative is a much bigger, broader, deeper subject than just writing, you know, what is our history and how great we are as a nation. There's a lot more to it. Now this book has three parts. The, the book I'm writing called The Indian Grand Narrative. Part one is the early history of the grand narrative and what the narrative was and how it evolved. There were versions of it, how it evolved and the evidence for it. Part two is a disruption. How it got disrupted? We have the Islamic invasion, we have the European, we, we also have the post-independence, five waves of ideology, a very, very destructive uh, enterprise over the last 70 years. Very, very destructive to our grand narrative. Now, many people, when they talk about colonialism, they limit themselves to British. Actually, there is an Islamic colonialism, and this is a controversial point. I mean, my fellow Indians don't like this, you know, I tell you, Islam is a colonial system. They don't like it. I'm not anti-Islam, by the way. My controversial point, which I'll come to, is actually to tell you that what my view is of Islam, and it's not an anti-Islam thing. They're Islamic invaders, and a Muslim should disown them and say that just because he's my religion doesn't mean he's good. I mean, Dr. Swami doesn't say that because uh, some corrupt fellow, you know, uh, uh, is a Hindu or something and maybe he's doing puja and all that, therefore we give him a free pass. I mean, if he's a crook, he's a crook. And so, we have to do that. So, the second part is the disruptive. And the third part is the most important one, which is the future which is the future. What is, so there is a disruption and there is a construction. What is the constructive aspect? How do we construct a grand narrative? Which is scientific for today, which accepts the reality. We have minorities, that's a reality. We have all the problems, all sorts of problems, that's a reality. We have, you know, so it, you have to be very realistic in evaluating the circumstances we are in. And then, then you can propose, construct, discuss, what the solution is to that. Now, the research that I've been doing is not a description of this invasion happened, this fight happened, this is the history. It goes into deep structures. There are deep structures of our civilization. There are deep, uh, you know, frameworks starting with the Vedas and so on, very deep frameworks. There is a role of Sanskrit, there is a role of uh, uh, Siddhant, there is so many things. These keep assimilating more and more changes. The Smritis keep change. The Shrutis are the same. The Smritis change. So when you want to study the grand narrative, it is not frozen in time. It is not like Ye Kahani Hamesha Ki Asi Thi. It has changed. At the same time, you can't say that, okay, it's a new country, a new narrative totally. So how do you reconcile? Something is the same and something is also different. So one way I propose is that we have been reincarnated. That's our idea. So Bharat has been reincarnated into modern India. And Sanatana Dharma got reincarnated into modern Hinduism. So it is both modern and it is also continuous, a continuity of an old, old Atma. 
old Atma. Deen Dhyal Upadhyaya called it Chitti, that every nation has a Chitti. And the body can go, new one comes, but there is a Chitti we should understand and we should build a whole society around that Chitti. And I've lectured many times that, unfortunately, the Deen Dhyal Upadhyaya died very early, as you know, and his project, was just, nobody continued it. You see, this is a part of a kind of a laziness we have. We feel that I don't have to do anything. A lot of people ask me, why are you doing this so and so? Vivekananda already wrote this or Aurobindo already wrote it. The point is, the point is, the opponents are on the move. The disruptive forces are always doing something new. You cannot say that the Nurkar is actually like Aditi, so now we don't have to do The point is, you have, to, you have to do your work. What was done at that time was good at that time. But to, you see, even in Deen Dhyal Upadhyaya's time, Marxism existed. Marxism existed. Post-colonial studies which Edward Said developed was after Deen Dhyal Upadhyaya. That was another wave. Then leading to subaltern studies. Then leading to postmodernism studies. Now there is something new called uh, neo-orientalism. So they come up with these fancy terms and these are it's like if somebody wants to study Vedant, you can't just study Adi Shankara, you have to study all the future, all the subsequent developments. You can't just study and say, okay, uska jawab de diya, to ho gaya. Because you have to study all the nuances, all the variations, all the subsequent challenges and answers and all that. So same way, when we have intellectuals who are to respond to the international bombardment that we face, the disruption that we faced, it is not enough to say Vivekanand gave an answer because he gave it for his time, Sri Aurobindo gave it for his time, Deen Dhyalapadhyaya gave it for his time, and these people actually, one over the other, evolved. They all had something different and new to say. So now in the 21st century, where are the Deen Dhyalapadhyayas? We, we need to do this new thinking. So this is, this is something we haven't, I, I, it's difficult to come across, and it's not just a few speeches here and there, it's serious work, serious hard work that you, we have to do. So that's what I'm trying to do, and that is what I will summarize in this uh, book called The Indian Grand Narrative. Now I will turn to the controversial chapter I want to talk about. I have a certain amount of minutes left, and I want to focus on this one chapter. It will be one of maybe a dozen chapters altogether. The chapter has deals with where are what is the place for Indian Muslims in our grand narrative? And you can see this is a very hot topic. You know, dhyan te bonate. So I, I started conducting some interviews in Delhi with Muslims. Young, broad-minded, educated Muslims. And many of them are involved in this triple tel talaq, you know, fighting Tripal Talaq and, and all this uh, polygamy and things like that. And I started asking them questions about everything controversial even. And I have videotapes them. I put them on videotape. I'm going to edit, put them out in public and they are willing. So I found to my surprise, there are substantial number of Muslims who've had it with Orthodox Islam and who feel that the vast majority of Indian Muslims are not well-educated people and they are therefore driven by whatever the Imam says. And the Imam is looking for his own power structure. And these more educated, professional type Muslims don't like it. They, are, they have fear, some of them, and there is kind of not necessarily an organized approach. So there is also a leadership issue. They need some encouragement, they need some, some organizational help. So I figured this is a, this is a fruitful uh, enterprise, fruitful area of my investigation as part of my grand narrative. Because imagine if I wrote a book called The Indian Grand Narrative and there's nothing about Muslim, Muslims, except that they destroyed some things, you know, a thousand years ago they destroyed, which they did, and my book is very clear, very strong on all the Muslim destruction. But the question still remains, what about today? What do we do today? So, I don't accept the voice, with the Muslim voice which says reject Islam, so the Tariq Fateh type. Because if you reject Islam, maybe a few people will go along with that. 
But the majority of Muslims are not going to just say, okay, we reject Islam. And the ghar wapsi is going to be fine for some people. I think it's not a practical idea that you do ghar wapsi of the whole lot of people. I don't think that's going to work. So these are fine. They're okay. I mean, there should be internal criticism in every religion. So some people are anti-Islam from within. That's fine. That's their choice. And some people may want to do ghar wapsi. That's also their choice. But I wanted to find out, is there a narrative where the person is a proud Muslim, but he's before that, first and, first and foremost, he's a proud Bharatiya. And I wanted to investigate that. So I have a name for it. And I have a domain name also. And there's going to be a chapter with that name. And this is, I'm calling such people, Swadeshi Muslims. That's my name. Now people ask, why not Indian? And I said, because you know, when you say Indian, so Behaz Parthiya was India 70 years old, did British make it, was it Hindustan? So you know, I don't want a diversion. People like to divert and our people then go into arguing that. Swadeshi Muslims has no, uh, no, no kind of ambiguity in what it means. Swadesh, this is my desh. So if I, if I were to say, are you an Indian Muslim proud, he'll say, yeah, 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 but when you go deep into it, he's only talking in a certain camouflaged way. He's not really what I am looking for. But when I say, is this your Swadesh? Matri Bhumi, Pitri Bhumi, this is it. Which means, and I define very clearly, that your ancestors are from here. They didn't come from the Middle East. So when we talk about decolonizing, getting rid of the British influence, then also decolonizing, de de-Arabizing is something you ought to do because Islam, if you claim Islam is a universal faith that Allah has brought to everybody in the, in the world, then Arab customs, dress, names, habits are not necessarily going to supersede the Indian customs and culture. You can still be a Muslim. So, I challenge this and I have this on videotape and when I go back uh, to Delhi tonight, Tuesday I have another meeting with this group. So every time I'm telling them, we we'll go bring, bring a few more friends and we'll see how far you'll go. But I think it will become an interesting movement. So I, I even said things like, uh, uh, the Swadeshi Muslim, it has to claim our heroes, the heroes of the soil, rather than the invaders as the heroes. So, the, maybe the invaders were of your religion and uh, your ancestors were natives, Swadeshis, who lost and you, you became, uh, you now adopt the religion of the, of the invaders and I am not asking you to convert, I am not asking you to do anything that, you can remain that, but can you be a Muslim without being Arabized or Persianized or Turkish? Can you be a Bharatiya style Muslim? And this is a very interesting thing, I tell them that my experience in Indonesia has been very helpful because in Indonesia, they say their language is Bhasha. They write in the English alphabet, but they're writing Bhasha. And when I ask them, who are you, we're Muslims, so why, what is this Bhasha thing? And so they're, they're saying that our ancestors came from India. They're saying that our civilization came from India. Actually, this is a very, it started as a, uh, I'll give you an anecdote, uh, just to divert a little bit. I was uh, leasing a office premises for my company. So this uh, Indonesian general manager, very good friend of mine, very soft-spoken, Muslim, but he's one of the philosophers that I would talk to at night, you know, and then he would introduce me to college professors of history and so on to teach me about their history, their grand narrative. So he took me to this uh, negotiation and the landlady was a Chinese. So he says, uh, uh, you talk because uh, you're American and she'll take you more seriously than taking me. So I said, why? It's your country. So he said, but in our country, we have an inferiority complex. We think Chinese are superior. He told me that. And then he said, but we think that the Indians are even more superior to the Chinese. This is what he told me. <laughs> so it's very interesting. So I learned a lot about you know, their idea. And then he's the one who said, if you really want these appointments with the telecom minister, this one, this one, bring an American blonde lady, they all give appointments. 
So I learned this uh, cultural thing, you know. Actually, it worked. I uh, then took this, uh, I had a secretary. So I told her, we give you cards saying vice president, all that. You sit there next to me, I'll do the talking and all, just sit, smile and all that. No, don't say anything. So, we brought her to, we, we, in India also it works. In India, before all these phone companies, uh, we had something called MTNL. MTNL and uh, uh, BSNL was the international carrier. Monopoly, only BSNL calls. And MTNL was domestic. So to do this venture that we were doing, we had to do business with these people. So I remember, she was so successful in getting meetings with these people. They would all say, well, they would be, like ignoring me and talking to her, but I'm the boss actually, I own the company. <laughs> and she's a secretary that we glorify. Taki people will take her seriously. So they're all into her dying G, dying G, dying G, co, uh, coconut water lago. Dying water, nothing to do with any coconut water. But they were really into pampering her that she's this dying person, this white lady coming in, blonde. So it got into her head. So then, you know, when they would ask uh, uh, to negotiate the contract, the deal, the whatever I was presenting, uh, they would start talking to her. And she got into her head that, way, I am powerful. So she started talking to them and I am left out. <laughs> so one day, I gave her a warning. I said, in front of them, it looks you are VP and I am the president and all that. And they may be wanting to talk to you, but do not, do not outsmart my terms of agreement because my company you can't negotiate but she was got into so much power because they started inviting her and all that that she would try to cut her own deal so i fired her i fired her then i was very concerned yeah i need a solution so someone told me you go and hire an actor because actors know ki a script has script <laughs> So I put an ad at the Rutgers University, which is in Princeton, big university, they have a theatre department. I went and put an ad saying, uh, we'll pay the expenses, uh, you'll perform the role of an American corporate executive, you will go to a foreign country, you live in a five star, you get first class flying back here, and you'll perform this role. So then I auditioned some people, hired somebody, and said, first thing I said is, it's not your deal. The producer and director is telling you what you have to say. <laughs> and you just say it. And so anyway, that was a very big success. But back to the Indonesia story. I learned a lot about Muslims who have not become Ashrafized. Ashraf means those Muslims who feel we are ancestors, we are, our ancestors were Arab or Iranian or Turk. It's like Anglo-Indians started thinking that we are And for a while, when I was a kid, every Christian used to think that my grandmother was so one-eighth or something was English. You know. Everyone wanted to have some little trace of British blood to kind of legitimize and say, I'm a little superior to you. And today you find that among the Goans. You go to Goa, there are a lot of people who, who want to say I'm Portuguese hey, and all that. I, I know some Goan friends who don't like it, they're Goan Christians who don't like it. But there is this sense of... Uh, uh, superiority over, you know, some foreign DNA. So, Muslims have this problem, Ashraf. And when you, when they tell you, Aka caste system, if you don't have a caste system, you can talk right back and say, you have Ashraf, Ajraf, and Azraf. These are Muslim castes in India. They don't marry with each other. They, they consider themselves to be separate qom, you know, and so on. And this is a very serious problem in Pakistan. The ones who are from Bihar are considered lower caste and so forth. So, if you really do the DNA test, of Indian Muslims. You will find that actually most of them are Swadeshis, they don't know it. But so we, are, we would just sort of uh, re-educate them that this is who you are. There's also a scientific way, it's a very, very tiny fraction of the uh, DNA component of the Muslim population that would be like Arabs. So I tell them, uh, so back to my research. I started telling them that, uh, you know, Arabs, are not as civilized as we are. You should be proud of our heritage. You can be a religion is different from being an Arab race and an Arab culture. It is different. So there are certain practices that enter a religion because it's in the culture around. 
you know, like maybe talaq or maybe multiple wives and all these kind of things, but they are not really part of the original religion. There is a certain context. I wish they had separated Smriti from Shruti. I wish they had done that, then we could argue very clearly that this Shruti mein ye nahi hai. this is in your Smriti, you can change it. And why do you want to bring Arab Smriti here? You can bring the Shruti, which is it, uh, universal. But the Smriti has to be locally localized and updated. And that way they could be modern, technological, scientific, they could be, you know, Swadeshi Muslims. They could, absolutely, because they have to accept that their origin is Swadeshi. And their heroes are Swadeshi. Their sacred land and sacred sites are here. Here. So, when you uh, talk about decolonizing, and there are all these conferences, conclaves, article, there's almost one conclave every day or every two, three conclaves a week at least going on all over India. Manthan, conclave, this and that, lit fest going on. And decolonizing is a very common fashionable theme. But you know, they're decolonizing from the Europeans. They're afraid to talk about decolonizing from the Muslims. And, de and one of the things I demand the, uh, as a criteria for being a proper Swadeshi Muslim is that you should accept that we ought to decolonize the Muslim population from the Arab identity. And this Ashrafa, Ashraf business, this, uh, we should be proud to be who we are. And we can be very proud to be Muslims. So I don't, I, I'm working with these experts, some imams have entered this group, some lawyers have entered, and we'll see where it goes. But I'm, I'm experimenting with this idea that can there be a total conformity to Islam, which is not hostile to this sacred nation and to the Hindus, and which is not uh, sort of more loyal to the West Asia type of uh, cultures. The Arabs who, who were the Origin, who were the place where Islam originated, and Jerusalem, where you know the various places in Israel, where uh, first Judaism originated, and then Christianity originated, and then in the same general region, Islam originated. These are desert religions. They are desert religions. We are a forest civilization, green forest, waters, fertile, uh, plenty. We are not sort of uh, hungry for food because nothing grows. You see. So, so it, the desert tribes have a different kind of ethos and we, it's not a, not a desirable thing that every Indian Muslim has to copycat the desert, the desert type of lifestyle. So this is, a, this is a, as I told you, it's a controversial, it's going to be uh, risky and I'm willing to take that risk. Uh, but I think that if we can create a core group, even small, who say we are Swadeshi Muslims, it will be the beginning of a quite a big, tip, it will be a tipping point and it can have a ripple effect and I would like to put that as my take on Islam or Muslims in my Indian grand narrative. That one. Thank you. You see, if we don't do that, the breaking India forces are all controlled from elsewhere. So you want to snap that link from elsewhere. True. Whether it is Saudi money coming, I mean, there's nothing wrong, have madrasas, have universities, fine. But why is Saudis dictating who will be the appointed, uh, you know, of, uh, the faculty and what the curriculum will say? Why is the ultimate adhikari of knowledge sitting there when you have your Quran, you can interpret it? And, so, and, and then similarly with, with uh, British, with, with sorry, Western, Christian, uh, I, I see every minority group mischaracterized as a minority. Uh, or let me put it this way, those minority groups that have a foreign nexus, that are a footprint, local footprint of an international powerhouse, are mischaracterized as a minority. Actually, it's a branch office of a powerful majority. Because if you had a small office of... If you had a small office of uh, IBM where there's 100 people, you wouldn't say, well, 100 have the Choti C venture, it must be minority. And if you see <laughs> McDonald's with 20 employees, you're not going to say it's a minority, we just give them minority status. So similarly, if you have a church or a, or a madrasa with a small number of people, I mean, the point is that they are controlled, they are appointed, they are funded, they are trained by a global headquarters. They are more like an MNC. And if you look at the rules governing the Vatican, the Catholic Church, the Vatican appoints 
please note this, the Vatican appoints every bishop in India. So if a foreign headquarters is appointing who the manager will be in every branch, every branch, they control the funding, they certainly control the ideology, they send them there for training. How can you say this is not a foreign enterprise? It is an MNC. And the Vatican is also a sovereign state. It is a member of the United Nations. United Nations. So they are a sovereign state. So when a sovereign state appoints somebody to represent them, it's a consulate. So rather than saying that they are a minority and get special privileges, they are actually a foreign consulate. Every church is a foreign consulate. I mean, I mean, it may sound politically incorrect, but the fact is that hiding under the garb of religion and religious freedom and religion's kokuch kaheni sakte, point is that under the garb of religion, it is a sovereign state which is running this operation, this whole franchise of uh, local establishments. This is something we ought to discuss. We ought to be able to have free conversations and maybe litigation also, or maybe let the courts intervene and say, you know, China has a good precedence. China decided that there's no bar on Christianity, but there's a bar on foreign church intervening. So they do not accept foreign appointed bishops. They demand that the Chinese have to organize. You can read the Bible, you can worship Jesus, no problem. But why do you need uh, somebody sitting somewhere else to appoint you? So this is a very uh, powerful like, argument uh, that our people need to uh, need to uh, take forward. The Muslims who I my I'm, I'm formulating right now, and if those of you are interested in joining, can email me and we can include you in the discussion. But I'm formulating with the help of Swadeshi Muslims, a few of them, a charter, which is written by them. I'm not saying this is what it is. I'm suggesting ideas. And so far they've accepted that, you know, cow slaughter is not a required part of Islam. Not a required part of Islam. The U.S. Commission on Religious, International Religious Freedom, which uh, puts out a report every year and accuses India, India of human rights violations and all that, in their latest report, uh, they, one of the big arguments they put up is that uh, this cow slaughter is a violation of Islamic rights. So I went, they invited me because I always keep criticizing them. They invited me in Washington, D.C. to have a discussion with them. And I found out that the young man in charge of writing and tracking human rights violations of India is a Pakistani scholar. <laughs> I have his card. He's very proud. He got a PhD from American University on South Asian Studies, religious freedom issues. So he's become an expert. Very smart on the Pakistan. He applied young code Nikalos made, you know, and then put him in all these jobs. So he 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 give me all this stuff, and I'm sitting there with all all the white people, the Jewish Christian people, the commissioners, and all the people, other people. And I'm saying this guy doesn't know. In Islam, you see. Cow does not exist, is not exist in the desert. Cow is a tropical animal. It is not a desert animal. And the Arabs eat uh, goat and uh, camel. They don't eat cow. The cow is just uh, now it's a luxury item, some sheikhs might eat it and all. But for a thousand years, is the you know beginning the, the more fourteen hundred years or whatever, uh, the the Arabs have not been uh, cow beef eaters. So why you say it's a requirement? It is not a requirement, it's just a, they've adopted it. And in fact, if you look at Dharampal's research, Dharampal showed that cow slaughter is something the British popularized on a big scale. It existed on a small scale. It was not like a massive industry of millions and millions of cows like we're having today. That uh, industrialization of cow slaughter happened starting with the British and after independence it became even bigger. So this is not a something of uh, that started in Saudi Arabia or any of that stuff. So this is something that when I mentioned these facts, the Sudeshi Muslims that I'm working with accepted and said, yes, we, we think our slaughter should be stopped because we, why, why do we want to hurt our Hindu friends? That's the kind of mentality I'm looking for. Another controversial thing I have asked them is Ram Temple. I've said that in your in Islam, there are holy sites but no sacred sites. Sacred means this stone is not a stone, this is the divine present. This is a divine presence. I'm talking to the divine, hi, hello, hello, and how are you? I'm having a conversation with the divine. 
the protocol is the Agama, giving me protocol, and I'm having this conversation. You consider it blasphemy if somebody says that inside the, inside the mosque is where Allah is. Allah is not in the mosque. They know that. They know that. So uh, what is a mosque? A mosque is a community center. A mosque is only a community center. It's a convention center, a community center where Muslims can go to one place and feel that, okay, from together uh, we can just pray to Allah. It is from where you are praying to Allah, a very arbitrary place. It, there is no reference on how, you, what kind of place it has to be, what it can't be. It can be anywhere. It, you can pray from your house. You can pray on the street. You can pray in a mosque. You can pray anywhere you want. You can pray in an airport. There is no requirement. There is nothing comparable to Pran Pratishta in Islam, which would make a particular mosque a sacred place. So this is why if you ever tell a Muslim, that I love your sacred mosque. If he's a knowledgeable fellow, he's not agree with it because it is considered idolatry. He says it's not a sacred place. Matter is not sacred. There is no sacred river, sacred uh, you know tree or mountain or building. There is no form. There is no Allah is not in form. So where we have the divine taking form. So Allah is not in form, and therefore you can't uh, consider the mosque at all to be a sacred place. So if you tell them that, and the fact that I have so many examples of uh, Saudi Arabia and all the different uh, Muslim countries uh, demolishing, moving, relocating mosques from here to there, there is absolutely no reason whether, see, the burden of proof should not be on us that this is the birthplace of Ram. The burden of proof is that we have been worshipping here for a long time for whatever reason. It is our house of worship. And the fact that we did Pran Pratishta is, makes it a sacred place. And the fact that the Bauri Masjid, there is nothing equivalent to Pran Pratishta means it can be moved. That is the argument. It has nothing to do with whether it, uh, Ram was born there or not. I happen to believe he was. So. There is no point in taking a higher burden of proof than necessary. So this is why Swami's uh, argument is very brilliant. He says he has a right to worship them. He has a right to worship them. And it has nothing to do with all the other arguments. He says, I have a right to worship because the deity of Ram had Pran Pratishta was here. That we can establish. And I as a Hindu have a right to worship that deity. That's it. So why, why create a higher hurdle for us to have to jump over. So we can just say this, the, the difference between Pran Pratishta of a Murti and no such equivalent in a mosque is a decisive argument. That when you move the mosque, you are not violating anything. When you destroy a Murti, you are. So when I say it like this to the my small group of Swadeshi Muslims, they actually like it. They say, you know, we should actually help our Hindus to create the temple. There are some of So this, uh, this, uh, and then I've talked about 370. They feel there's no reason why it should be separate from the rest of India. I've talked to them about uniform civil court. And they've said, you know, we should be treated like the rest of, especially I'll tell you, we should start with educated, professional, young women. They are very fed up of this whole uh, imam dominated, uh, male dominated kind of a th interpretation. They would like to get out of it. And we can help them, we can give it, rather than saying I'm going to knock out Islam, I'm against Islam, Islam is wrong, because that is not going to attract a whole lot of people. And rather than saying, okay, you convert and become Hindu again, if you just say, I want, I, they were very relieved when I said to them, I want to respect you as Muslim, but it has to be mutual, you respect me as Hindu, I respect Islam and the core, core tenets of Islam. I am not at all against any of them. I think that this Arabization and this politicization and this vote banking and all these kind of things that have happened over time are the ones that you have to uh, decolonize from. When I say it like that, they are very interested in joining us because believe me, they are also looking for a way out. They feel that they are also stuck in this uh, very, very old, uh, you know, closed-minded uh, interpretation which is not going to work in this, in the modern world, it is not going to work. So, this is my Swadeshi uh, Muslims uh, initial initiation, my Muslims movement. Now, I have a whole lot, but I, I, maybe we can take it in the, in the Q&A, but I, I, have a, I have a diagram in my book, uh, which is a game board. 
So there is the existing game, and then there is another diagram which is how I want to change the game. So the existing game is, is uh, the Muslims are at the center, and they have all these forces, the Arabs funding, you know, the Arabs, Iranians sending funding. Some of that is through the agents, they call, they've trained imams to think a certain way. There is this whole Urduization which is also a problem, I feel, because nothing requires that in Islam that you have to Urduize, you could be in Malayalam, Bengali. The whole reason East Pakistan was split off and became Bangladesh is because Sheikh Mujibur Rahman won the election on the basis that he wanted Bengali and not Urdu, which the, the Pakistanis were not willing to give. So he won the election and they separated. So there is nothing in Islam that says you got to Urduize or Arabize. So all these are sort of uh, identity engineering gimmicks that give political clout and create breaking India forces. So I'm against that. I'm not against Islam at all. So when I when uh, uh, the game board, present game board shows Muslims with all these forces, left wing manipulating them, political people bringing them this way, that way to <coughs> promise them. You know, they are against modernity, there's a tension with modernity. So the Muslim is sitting inside with all these tensions. He's got so many tensions. And he's not able to play the game, make his moves and win. So the new game board, all these middlemen and forces are out. The, the Swadeshi Muslim and Hindus, so let's start with Hindus first and then we can bring in other faiths are in direct conversation, direct dialogue to find an equilibrium which is mutually respectful. So mutual respect as a principle for equilibrium is what I'm trying to achieve and I want them to just ignore all these other forces that have been controlling them and talking on their behalf. Equilibriums are related to grand narrative. There are equilibriums in nature. So for instance, you have an ecosystem, you have a water cycle, you know, there's an equilibrium of the solar system. Uh, there's an equilibrium inside the body. Ayurveda tells you when the equilibrium is disrupted, it's the first stage of disease, you know. Then something is going to accumulate and blockage and whatnot. There are four stages of disease. The first is that some equilibrium is a little bit disrupted. So there are many kinds of equilibrium. There is social equilibrium. The Varna system had a kind of a cyclical equilibrium uh, among the different uh, social capital. Uh, that got disrupted. So that has now become a problem. So I. Uh, what I told them is that if there is a healthy, dynamic equilibrium between Swadeshi Muslims and Hindus, this will be strengthen the Indian grand narrative because the grand narrative will become a stable equilibrium. We currently have an unstable, tentative, volatile equilibrium. We do have it, but it is always ready to, you know, there's so much, so many centrifugal forces, we are always on the brink of something or other happening and we're spending a very large percentage of our GDP on internal equilibrium, just maintaining, maintaining the internal, uh, you know, unity uh, in so much hard power, so much hard power has to go. So if we can crack this soft power problem of the Muslim mind, psychology, uh, and, and create a wave of Swadeshi Muslims, even if it starts with very few, but then we let them go and expand as more get educated, and get into science and get into professions, uh, I would see that the Swadeshi Muslim, uh, you know, clout and power and importance will increase. So I'm, uh, I'll conclude by saying that uh, I'm going to uh, create a small group of Swadeshi Muslims, give them empowerment, tell them you define, I put all this stuff out, now you define how you want it, and we can sponsor a regular seminars on Swadeshi Muslims run by them, run by them, and promote them, and encourage them to have to uh, to run this website. So it is not going to be me doing it, but encourage them to do it. Once this is launched and in their hands and operating, I also intend to create a Swadeshi Christians, another one. So I will conclude because I've taken a lot of time and thank you very much for inviting me and I'm delighted to be here.